Well, I like that message. We're almost home. <clears throat> and it's also true about Revelation. Uh, we are almost finished with Revelation. And uh, it wouldn't upset me if the Lord came before I finished the book of Revelation uh, because I know whom I believed and I am convinced that our redemption draweth nigh. And my prayer today is if you don't know Christ as your Savior, Folks, it's hard for me to preach a sermon like I'm going to preach today because it's going to show you hell is real, folks. Nobody's preaching about it anymore. We've almost become numb to it or we try to ignore it. Uh, but I'm telling you, I've been under heavy burden this week about this message. I want to thank Brother Phil for preaching for me last Wednesday and uh, Dr. Kemp Holden last Sunday. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, a good pulpit here. Uh, he's, he's, uh, several of you have said how much you enjoyed him. Uh, three people specifically said that sermon was for them, uh, walking through the valley. So I thank God uh, for those who filled in while I was gone. Uh, we did have a restful time. All right, we uh, stayed in a treehouse, I will say. Uh, I've never done that, and I will do it again, but just not next year, okay? <laughs> so I can say that. I want to say uh, two weeks ago, uh, I said something in my sermon that I, I don't remember saying it, and I know I did not mean what I had said, and I need to correct this, okay? I'm human, and I don't know sometimes my thoughts patterns just are not. I mean, I try to stay on tune and in tune with the Lord, but uh, when we were talking about premillennialism and amillennialism, I guess when I said all millennialism, I can't even say the word right now, uh, that I said something about it, it's, it's okay, I, I see that, but it's not okay and I don't see that. Because all means no. And what you're saying is, we're not having a millennium, a thousand year reign. And I, I don't know where it came from. I apologize for saying it, uh, but I'm pre-trib. I, I think, you know, we're going to have it. And then after the tribulation, uh, obviously in scripture, uh, we are going to follow along with that, with the great white throne judgment. So I want to correct myself there. Uh, folks, I can admit when I'm wrong. And uh, sometimes, like I said, I don't know what my thought process was, uh, but I have talked to the Lord about it, and we are good. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. The great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. If you have an outline in the bulletin, you want to follow along with us. Uh, three simple points today. Number one, the scene. Okay, what is this scene? What is going on in the first verse, chapter uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 11. Number two, the summons. And folks, when you get a summons to court, you either go to that summons or they're going to come looking for you. All right? And here is one summons that they won't have to come look for you. All right? God knows where you are. God will uh, summons and you will show up. Okay? We're all going to I hope you understand we're all going to stand before God. My Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. We've taught already that uh, uh, after the rapture of the church, uh, the Bema seat, the judgment of Christians or believers will happen. And our sins have already been uh, judged on the cross. Jesus paid for our sins. Uh, what we are doing at, the, uh, at that Bema seat is, is our rewards or our works. Okay, and and this is a completely different thing. This uh, this throne, this great white throne judgment, is for the lost, for the unbeliever, for those who have never uh, put their faith in trust in Jesus Christ. So we see the scene, we see the sub, uh, summons, and we see the sentence. And I am telling you, folks, uh, there are going to be no appeals. All right, when, when God pronounces this, when Jesus says this, it's a done deal. 
And I know what some people, they justify it in their minds saying, well, you guys believe the Bible, but I don't believe the Bible. Well, folks, whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen according to the Word of God. And I have staked my life, 44 years of ministry, being a Christian and walking with the Lord, and I know this is going to happen. That's why my heart breaks today, because there's still people that will walk out of here today that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord. And my job, my, my whole goal is to help you to see how things are really going to be. This isn't fun. This isn't a game, all right? You're talking about all of eternity, and that is so important. You know, the scripture we will be reading today is truly one of the most serious and tragic uh, passages in the Bible. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Satan has been lying to all of mankind. He has influenced and convinced millions of people that hell is not real, there is no judgment for mankind, and when you die, you are just dead. My friend, the Word of God teaches us that hell is real. Everyone will stand before God and be judged, and you only have two choices, heaven or hell. The believers will go to the Bema Seat Judgment where their works are judged. Your sin was judged on the cross. Jesus' blood paid for our sins, and unbelievers will appear at the great white throne judgment to be condemned to hell for rejecting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Let's look at this final word uh, from God about the reality of hell. And by the way, I want to start out and say this. I've, I've heard this several times in my lifetime when I'm witness to somebody. And they say, what kind of God would send someone to hell? Let me tell you this, he has never sent someone to hell, all right? He gives everyone the freedom of choice, everyone. Even Psalm says we can see God in nature, all right? Everyone has a certain amount of faith. We use faith every day in our life, but that doesn't mean you are saved, that doesn't mean you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to repent of your sins. You have to give yourself totally to God. All right? And that's, that is so important. And so many people, there's going to be so many people uh, that don't believe that, and they're going to die and spend an eternity away from God. So let's look at our scripture today. Revelation 20, verse 11. Revelation 20, 11, the scene. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, uh, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. 51 times in Revelation, you'll see the word throne. It's in every chapter of Revelation. And, and, it's, and we know this is a change of scenery. This is a new vision, okay? Uh, you know, S Satan was crushed. Jesus uh, came in and, 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 and uh, sentenced them. If you look at the last verse in chap chapter uh, 10, and they will be tormented day and night and forever and ever. So, last battle. It was here on earth. All was done, and the judgment comes. And here it says, and him who sat on it. Uh, there's kind of a little uh, discrepancy in the commentaries. Uh, some people believe that it's God uh, who is sitting on the throne, and others believe it is Jesus. And I want to point out, I'm, I'm not going to pick sides, but I'll give you my opinion. My opinion is it is Jesus, okay? Uh, by the way, in Revelation 21, uh, if you'll read that twice, in the first verse and the third verse, it says God and Jesus on the throne. So they are together there. But I want to give you a couple of reasons why I believe this. Uh, John chapter 5. John chapter 5. It, it's just one verse here. John 5. Well, let me get to it. John chapter 5, is it up there? There we go. Let me, just, let me just grab it up here. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all the judgment to the Son. Now that's Jesus' words. 
So we need to take Jesus. And the other thing I want to point out, if you realize God and Jesus are one. He has said that all along. So, you know, don't make a huge deal out of this, okay? Because I I believe God is sovereign. God is over all. But I believe this task uh, is is, uh, is for Jesus. Because I believe he was the one that lived a life he was one that died. Folks, he, di- he didn't die just for those believers. He died for everyone. His blood pays for everyone's sin. It's just that some people do not believe, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And before we go that, I want you to see uh, Old Testament prophecy talking about uh, the great white throne judgment. Daniel chapter 7. Go with me to Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place. Daniel 7, 9. And the Ancient of Days was seated, and his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was a fiery flame. It swills a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him, a thousands of thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So we see Daniel in the prophecy of things that were to come. And then it says in the second part of that verse, whose face from earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And again, we're talking about after the millennium. And we are in between the millennium and the new heaven, which we will talk about uh, next week. So he's basically saying again, uh, you know, after all the judgments, after all that, God, uh, you know, created the millennium period and the millennium time, which was different than the way the world was or the world that we live in. And then the last part, this is in between uh, in verse chapter 21, it'll say a new heaven and a new earth, and we will be talking about that next week. Matthew 25, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture to back up what I believe he is saying here. Matthew 25, and we're going to start in verse 31. I'm not going to read all that. We'll we'll read verse 31 and then go to 41, but if you look at the title of that section, it says, the Son of Man will judge the nations, and this is Jesus' words. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And then, you know, down through here, we are talking about the sheep and the goat. The sheep are Christians, are, are believers, and the goats are unbelievers. And there will be a separation of this. And Jesus is teaching this. And if you look chronologically, it's the end of his ministry here. All right, he is teaching uh, that this is going to happen. Now look at verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And one of the things that I run across more than once this week as I study was how much Jesus spoke on hell. And he was warning people. He was letting people know, you don't want to go there. Look at verse 42. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they, will, then they also will answer to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison or did not minister you? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, which means verily, verily in the uh, uh, King James Version, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it unto the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there's two judgments. The Bema seat is for Christians and uh, the lost Uh, is the great white throne judgment. And we need to remember this as we set uh, the scene. Second thing, number two, not just the scene, let's look at the summons. 
the summons. And the Bible says in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Folks, nobody gets out of this. It doesn't matter if you are the richest person in the world or you are the poorest person in the world. You're going to stand before God. And it's just going to be in you and God. And Lori and I, uh, we've been married for 43 years, but we will not be standing together. She will face uh, you know, judgment, and I will do it separately. We won't do it for our children. We won't speak for someone else. Okay, we will stand before God. And this, when it says saw the dead, that means uh, there's, there's not eternal life. That means you are dead. Okay, dead. Not just physically, but spiritually also. And it says, in small and great, and the books were open. Now, notice that plural. Or plural. There's books, all right? Just like the Bible is a book. Okay, the books would be more than one. And uh, to the Christians, uh, the books is uh, what, what we have done for Christ. From the time we got saved for the rest of our lives, we will be rewarded for what we did for Christ. And you think about it, uh, Jesus even told people, if you give a cold cup of water in my name, you will be rewarded. And folks, it's not one of those things we're going to look up in heaven and say, here's my pile right here. Boy, yours, your pile's not too big. All right? No attitudes in heaven. No comparisons in heaven. Because I believe with all my heart, we will take our rewards and we will lay them at the feet of Jesus. That's what it's about, folks. It's not about notching, well, how many people have you led to the Lord? Well, how many times, how much have you given? How, that's not what it's about, folks. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And the books were open. And the, the, the book of life is another thing. That's where every name of every Christian has been written. When you got saved, if you truly got saved, and folks, truly is the key here. I made a profession of faith when I was five. You've heard my testimony. I made another one when I was 14. And I believe with all my heart, if I would have died before 22, I would have spent an eternity in hell. God gave me two chances for salvation. And I wanted to run my own life. And I truly got saved when I was 22. And my name, praise God, was written into the Lamb's book of life. Nobody can take that away. Nobody can take my name off the roll. And it says, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, which I, I spoke of. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And here, everything, same thing, the Christians, everything that they have done, and the, the, the lost folks, everything that they have done. Their works also will be looked at. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 5. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. How do I know I'm saved? Number one, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit. When I sin, I feel bad about it all right number two i want to please my god i want to please him then it says for we must all notice that word all appear before the judgment seat of christ that each one may receive the things done in their body according to what he has done whether good or bad so everyone is going to stand before god and the books are going to be open the books is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? And if it's not, you have a book of what you have done, and you will be judged by that. And folks, it's not a work salvation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Are you 100% sure today, if you were to die, you would go to heaven? Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 
But we are well known to God, and I also trust we are well known in your consciences. And I promise you today, I'm not trying to scare you into heaven today. I'm trying to help you to understand that hell is real. And if you depart this life without Jesus Christ in your life, that is exactly where you will go. Romans 14, Romans 14, 12. So let each of us give an account of himself to God. So we see the books being open. We are being judged by God and Jesus. And the dead were judged according to the works. And look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And I had to ask myself, why? what's the deal about the sea? And what it means is a lot of times if somebody like is on a ship and they fall overboard, they never find the body, okay? Uh, and and they just, you know, they never actually find the physical body. So he's basically saying here that no matter how you die, because if you live long enough and God tarries his coming, you are going to die. We had a lady in our church, and it's been several years ago. She was 106 years old, 106, but she died. And that's what this part is saying. Nobody will escape the judgment. There is no place to hide, okay? Even if you don't find the body, okay, you have a soul and you have a spirit, okay? And that's, that's what he is talking about here. And death and Hades deliver up the dead. We will all die. If we, if, if we live long enough, we're going to die. And Hades, of course, is the abode of Satan. It is, it is that place uh, of Uh, the holding place for unbelievers, for unbelievers. And they will be delivered up, the dead, who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to their works. And folks, that's what he is talking about. He's saying that everyone, and when we're talking about the great white throne judgment, everyone who have ever lived, every lost person will be at the great white throne throne judgment. I'm talking back, uh, you know, in Adam and Eve days, all all the way to where we are, uh, you know, in our lives. So uh, the summons, you will come and God will judge you. So we see the scene and we see the summons. And the third thing I want you to see is the sentence. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And of course, death, again, I want to remind you, is talking about your body. And, and, and when it talks about uh, Hades, and, and it, you know, it talks about your soul. This is the second death. And if we're, we as Christians, we're only going to die one time. One time. When we die, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I'm telling you, the lost folks, you will die the second time. And here's the deal about it. You will, you will I'm, not, I'm not saying you will keep dying, but you would wish you had been able to die. Because I, 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 I witnessed to a college student in Lawton, Oklahoma, and his exact words were, when you're dead, you're dead. Well, folks, he don't know what the Bible says. He doesn't understand what the Bible teaches. And I know it is harsh, but folks, this is why, to me, all of Revelation uh, was written. It was written of how these end times, and I know eschatology, I know sometimes it's, there's so much symbolism, and it can be confusing there. But it is so matter-of-fact here in this Scripture here. Do you know Christ? If you know Christ, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? All right? Then you will go to heaven. But if not, you will spend it in eternity. That's what a lake of fire is. And this is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, folks, I talking to some students again. I did a college ministry uh, when I was doing youth ministry also. And, you know, the college student I witnessed to one time, he you know, our, our church, Cameron Baptist Church, you could throw a rock and hit in the college, 
uh, from where we were. Just right across the street was the college. And he just said, and, and I asked him the, the questions, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? He said, absolutely not. I mean, almost jokingly. And I thought, uh, do you realize you're going to stand before God? You know, and you're going to give an account in life? He goes, that's okay. And here's what he said. I want to go to hell. I would, I'd never had a person say that to me, ever. And I said, why would you want to do that? And he said, because all my friends are going to be there. I was floored. And I said, young man, I don't think you understand what you are saying. And even at that time, I, I, I knew this scripture and I took it to him. And he said what a lot of people say, I don't believe that. I mean, you believe the Bible, but I don't believe the Bible. And I'll tell you what, folks, when I left that apartment, my heart was broken. Broken, knowing that unless God intervenes later on in his life, this young man would spend an eternity in hell. Luke chapter 16. Luke 16, go with me. Luke 16. And Jesus tells this, the rich man and Lazarus, and there was a certain rich man who clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously, sumptuously every day. Rich guy. He had everything. He had money. He had a big house. He had possessions. He probably had a career. He probably had several businesses. He was extremely successful in the world's eyes. And it says, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who laid at his gate. Desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. You know what I figured out about death? When it comes to death, we are all equal. I don't care how much money you have. You are not taking it with you when you go. We all die broke, folks. We are broke. And it says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. Talking about Lazarus. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And what does it mean? The angels came and got his soul. Abraham, the father of faith, the father of faith. And the rich man died, also died, and was buried. Now look at this. Four times in this scripture, it says torments, torments. Hell is not a party, folks. It is called the lake of fire. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Folks, I believe it is literal flame, literal flame. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received the good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you being uh, tormented. And let me tell you something about poor folk, all right? Poor folk have souls. Poor folk need Jesus. Poor folk can, listen to this, be rich spiritually, Okay? I can't remember who the Hollywood star was, but they asked him. They literally said, uh, when is enough money enough money? And he said, when I make another billion dollars. Oh, folks, I am telling you, if you die without Christ, you are broke. You will have nothing but torment in the life hereafter. But a poor person, I'm just telling you, you know, we did mission work in Mexico, and it was one thing. Of course, I'm half Mexican, all right, anyway. And uh, it, it just, the thing that I understood, uh, we literally built a church on an old trash dump in Juarez, Mexico. And here's what I, uh, about the Mexican and, and my folks. They were poor down there, but yet they were family-oriented, and they were happy people. And folks, we have to understand it's not what's in your bank account. It's not what you drive. It's not what you wear, folks. It's what's in your heart. It's Jesus in your heart. 
And besides all this, verse 26, uh, between us, you see this great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. What is he saying? Oh, you finally figured it out, huh? You finally figured it out. Now you want to go on that side. He's just saying it's not happening. Folks, you have to do it. I mean, I suggest if you're lost, you do it today. Today. Because when you die, it's over. You're not going to. I talked to a guy one time, and I, I would just floor it. He said, I said, you know, if you were to die, would you, uh, you know, go to heaven? He said, no, I wouldn't. But you know what I'm going to do? When I hear that trumpet, I'm going to ask the Lord Jesus Christ into my life. I'm going to ask for forgiveness of my sins, and I'm going to get saved. And I said, have you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He said, no. I said, you know what a twinkling of an eye is? One one thousandth of a second. You're not having time to make that decision when the trumpet. All right? It's done. It has already been done. All right? You can't. And the other thing, folks, is you can't bargain with God. You can't bargain with God. God knows you very well. And it says, and besides all this great gulf, you cannot pass. Verse 27, then he said, I beg you. Look at the word here. All right, here's a rich man begging now. All right, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said unto him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Jesus saying, man, you have to be saved. You have to have the Holy Spirit uh, convict you of sin. The Holy Spirit draws you. And I tell you, the biggest mistake you will make in your life is to ignore the Holy Spirit. God could be drawing someone today. I jotted down just a few facts about hell. Number one, hell is real. Number two, hell is fire. Number three, hell is forever. Number four, hell is separation from God. Number five, hell is a prepared place, the Bible says. Number six, hell is for those who reject God's call to salvation through Jesus Christ. Number seven, hell uh, is continuous torment. Number eight, hell is a place for Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophets, and all demonic spirits. Oh, listen to me, folks. It's real. And I promise you, you do not want to go there. Matthew chapter 7 and I close with this scripture, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Why do you make wide gates? Because a lot of things are going to go through there. Okay? Folks, there are going to be a lot of people in hell. There's going to be a lot of people that have rejected Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And it says, and there will be many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is a way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Why do you have a narrow gate? Because there's not a lot of people going. And I judge no man of anything. I hope you understand that. I am not the judge. Folks, I'm simply saying we need to read the Bible, we need to believe the Word of God, and we need to act on the Word of God. Now look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Folks, fire insurance, aren't gonna, it's not going to get you there. That's what I did when I was five years old. I remember the only thing I can remember about that sermon, this guy, he had all white clothes on, and I thought that was a little weird then, you know, all white. And man, he was working, he was, took his coat off, took his tie off, and was up there screaming. And at the end, invitation, he said, if you don't want to go to hell, you get yourself down here right now. Well, folks, I wasn't dumb at age five. But he scared, he literally scared me to death. And nothing changed in my life. And I'm not saying a five-year-old can't be saved. But I'm telling you, I wasn't. I wasn't. 
who, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Now look at this list here. Prophesy, teach or preach, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. Okay? And then I will declare to them that I believe these are, this is the saddest four words in the Bible. I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, uh, uh, you who practice lawlessness. Oh, folks, it's so clear. The Bible today is so clear. And I know it's harsh. And I, I'm not going to apologize for preaching this because we're going right down through the Word of God. And if one person today puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Folks, I believe there are lost church members in this building. I'm not judging. I'm just saying we have to do it the way God says do it. You cannot save yourself. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't go to church enough. You can't give enough. You can't be nice enough to get there. Jesus himself said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And I ask you as we close, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Are you sure? Are you 100% sure if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Folks, this is why we have the invitation. This is why our guys stand here. That you will know Folks, my job is not to tickle your ears and make you feel good, even though I like to do that. I like to preach the positive things. But every once in a while, we need to be reminded of the truths of God's holy word. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I just thank you for, Lord, just this scripture. And God, I know it was a hard sermon, God, but it's the truth. And God, my prayer today is, if there's one here today that doesn't know you, just one, that they would come and talk to us. And God, we could give them and we could help them with Scripture be saved and make sure that their name is truly written in the book of life. And God, I also pray for the Christian that's here. We kind of forget about hell. And we have friends and neighbors, and family, that if things don't change, that's where they're going. And that's why we as Christians need to be busy about telling people about Jesus. It's real, man. It's real. What we have is real. And we can literally help them to Jesus Christ. God, if there's there that need to, those that need to follow the Lord in baptism or even join our church, God, I pray that you would speak to them. But God, just speak to us. God, I pray there would, even during the invitation, be a holy hush in this place. That we would be looking deep into our hearts and into our minds and knowing for sure that we are going. God, even the Bible tells us when one person gets saved, all of the angels in heaven rejoice. God, I pray there'll be some rejoicing this day. God, it's you. It's you. It's your word. It's you, your Holy Spirit. God, please draw someone to salvation this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?